I think there's an enormous opportunity to say, can we modernize the infrastructure where we can do these studies in a much faster fashion and evaluate. Generally in enterprises, decisions are made in the center on the top. And there, they're more reluctant to try out new ideas, to take on new things. Consumers are curious. There's an opportunity to much more tightly manage the care episode so you're both getting reimbursed more correctly. You're providing, most importantly, high value care and you're improving your frontline clinician's experience. Suchi Saria is the John C. Malone Associate Professor of Computer Science at the Whiting School of Engineering and of Statistics and Health Policy at the Bloomberg School of Public Health. She directs the Machine Learning and Healthcare Lab and is the founding research director of the Malone Center for Engineering and Healthcare. It's hard for me to imagine a system that's going to stay live and stay around five to 10 years from now if their strategy started with AI, no. So I think it's definitely a question of AI, yes, and the question of how and what and where do we perform given where we are. Saria's goal is to use sophisticated computer science and the deluge of data available in healthcare and other settings to individualize patient care and to save lives. Saria came to Johns Hopkins in 2012 and she earned her PhD from Stanford University. Teams where they have deep experience in the technology and deep experience in the domain and who really know how to productize to solve problems are the ones that are going to see the most amount of benefit. Now, let's join the conversation as host Julie Yu, general partner Andreessen Horowitz, speaks with Suchi Saria about the potential for AI to improve the way healthcare is best practiced. All right, Suchi, um, it's great to be in conversation here as you know, you are obviously one of the OGs of the AI space, uh, specifically as it applies to the healthcare domain. And it's obviously a very dynamic time right now. So very keen to get your perspectives. Um, one thing that was notable was that you recently announced participation in a consortium of folks who were thinking about the AI safety uh, dimension of everything that's going on right now. I think there's been a lot of consortia activities fitting up left and right, whether it be in the healthcare world, uh, many, of, many of which go back many years even, um, but certainly uh, in the last 12 months, we've seen a lot of that. Um, there's a ton going on, obviously, on the broader tech stage with the big tech companies taking a stance on this. And then obviously at the federal level, um, a lot of uh, hand wringing, let's call it, on um, on how to how to address this domain. Um, now, you, since you are involved in at least one, maybe multiple, you should you should talk about you know all the different groups that you're involved in. Um, I'm cu- curious to hear what what does success look like for you for these these consortia efforts. Uh, I think you know there are skeptics out there who say you know how much teeth do these efforts have, and what's the real tangible value that might come of these initiatives. Um, and then I think on the flip side, you know, industry players who might not be involved in some of these initiatives might feel like they're they're missing out or, you know, kind of not on the boat. Um, what are ways that, you know, folks in the broader ecosystem might be able to get involved or contribute to those efforts as well? Okay, so Julie, obviously you want to dive right in. Right I guess in. we're talking about AI safety, very interesting and important topic. Um, I guess maybe it'll be helpful for me to give a little bit of background so uh, people listening can kind of see where I'm coming from. So I've worked in the field of machine learning and artificial intelligence for a little over 20 years. Most of my early work was in the pure tech side of the house, uh, starting in robotics, got into healthcare around 2007, eight, have since then um, held uh, various positions, mostly within academia as a researcher, have been on many scientific advisory boards, have uh, spun out companies. And uh, I'm also now the Bayesian, uh, the CEO and founder of Bayesian Health, which is a company we spun out with six years of IP out of Johns Hopkins and um, is really focused on bringing uh, real-time AI at the point of care to augment care teams. Um, Trendy way that people think about these days is co-pilots for care teams. Um, Safety is an angle where I'm deeply passionate about. The last five years uh, on the research side of the house at Hopkins, we've done a huge amount of work uh, on AI safety. And in particular, um, I think there's sort of this Twitter notion of safety, which I call this, uh, they call it alignment, which is if we were to start building, um, you know, AI agents or bots that are, uh, if you have emergent properties or become sentient, how do you get them to align with human motives? I actually think among experts, that isn't considered to be one of the more important core areas of safety. Instead, um, coming back to a regulatory perspective, 
you know, uh, a, uh, the FDA, for example, has approved 500 plus AI tools to date in the last few years. And many of these are, you know, basically what I would call software as a medical device. It's software in radiology, software in pathology, software in clinical care. And what the software is doing is essentially, you know, using data in some way, synthesizing it to produce insights that then inform, uh, you know, a diagnosis or treatment or dosage. And in that scenario, uh, I think that's where there's enormous opportunity for thinking carefully about safety, which is as we deploy these kinds of AI tools, what is our rubric, end-to-end -end rubric? And in the scenario where AI falls under the rubric of our software as a medical device, that rubric becomes very firm and clear under the FDA. And other scenarios, maybe it doesn't fall under software as a medical device. The same principles and guardrails hold. There are right now in the last uh, two to three years, a number of different grassroots groups, including Coalition of Health AI, which I'm one of the con uh, founding members of. Um, when we started that group, the idea was to help health systems self-regulate and I, you know, cause we're building tools and we're deploying them and the ability to come up with some kind of end-to-end -end rubric or framework for understanding what does great look like? What does responsible safe ML deployment look like? Um, in my work with the FDA, wearing my researcher hat, We've been working on novel tools that they can use to modernize the FDA's framework for overseeing such kinds of tools. And then most recently, National Academies of Medicine taking sort of an, uh, you know, rather than sort of a specific agency, this is a cross-agency effort through the perch of the National Academies, is brought together a group to be able to sort of, you know, reconcile. There are so many different guidelines and rubrics can be basically reconciled to come up with something that is more usable very broadly. And the ideas are pretty simple. It's all the way from, can we identify what the key risks are? And sometimes half the risks are, you know, we are deploying software without fully understanding, you know, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Uh, I mean, you've seen this in digital health. I almost feel like all of digital health could benefit from some kind of discipline and regulation, right? Because there are all these um, Goals, you know, glitzy objects where we take something and we want to deploy it, but we don't fully understand what is it we were trying to do in the first place. What was the goal? How are we going to measure success? How do we know we're succeeding? How? What are the metrics? And then when we deploy AI in the real world, there's also this notion of it's learning from that site-specific data. Is it tuning correctly? Is it learning correctly? Is it Are there drifts and shifts we need to worry about? And those are the kinds of ideas that these rubrics will start to end produce a checklist that makes it very easy for whether the pro product is regulated or not regulated, there's some semblance of like, you know, best practice guardrails that people can implement e either within the system or anytime they're choosing to use AI. Yeah. And probably more, mo most importantly, creating a common language so that people are saying the right words in the right context and, and able to understand each other. So that's really interesting. You, you mentioned the FDA uh, and, you know, it's interesting in, in my conversations with folks in the, in the non-healthcare industries thinking about uh, how AI should be regulated. Many folks actually point to healthcare for once as sort of the tip of the spear example of how we actually do have a regulatory framework for uh, you know assessing and, and approving AI-based products uh, in the form of what you described, uh, whether it be SAMD or you know, the 510K path. Um, in what ways do you believe that the FDA model could be a model or a template for other industries? And you know, specific to healthcare, what do you think needs to evolve or further be addressed, um, even within the healthcare domain, uh, when it when it comes to the way that FDA has operated to date? Yeah, great question. I actually think that you're absolutely right that because of the history of, you know, needing to be careful and needing to measure and needed to ma manage risks, there's a lot more discipline here and understanding already in place around safety, and so. Um, a very simple way to think about this is uh, when the FDA looks to regulate a product, the first thing they start with, what is the intended use? Like for any piece of technology, what are you hoping to accomplish with that technology? Can you specify the who is to use it, how are they to use it, and what is it that we're trying to do? And then the next thing you do is to think about the risk benefit. Like what are the risks it poses and what is the benefit? And only if the benefit uh, you know, is dramatically higher than the risk, then the device is approved. And so in walking through this framework, now you basically then do tests and trials and studies to understand the benefit and the risk. And then you're able to demonstrate that essentially 
well, you first understood what it was supposed to do in the first place. You clearly articulated the risk. You clearly measured the benefit. And you have a framework in place to do the risk-benefit trade-off. Uh, that's very simple in a nutshell. And um, I think it's a very useful framework in introducing new technologies to market. Moving to kind of where there is opportunity modernized, I mean, practically speaking, the framework was written and built a long time ago. I mean, decades ago. And uh, when we're, I mean, uh, to me, one of the principal uh, gaps is basically the slowness with which the FDA moves. Today, there's so much opportunity for good, high quality new solutions that are beneficial to come to market. For instance, um, as an example, with Advasion, you know, we've spent years of research developing a solution for early detection of sepsis. Sepsis being one example, in a number of other areas, we are applying this platform technology that takes data that's already collected in the electronic health record. You know, we've already paid millions of dollars at every given health system to collect the data, but you can use this data intelligently to identify patients at risk for life-threatening complications. And now you can make those signals available within workflow, making it very easy for providers to identify, treat, close gaps, improve outcomes, cut financial waste. Now, the challenge remains though, that like um, in some of these areas, the FDA has expanded oversight and, and and is now, you know, wants to regulate. And, but our current process for regulating it is, you know, could, means many of these are de novo devices, right, could take years for the product to come to market. Um, and so I think there's an enormous opportunity to say, you know, can we, can we modernize the infrastructure where we can do these studies in a much faster fashion and evaluate? Uh, uh, another key gap there is um, this notion of post-marketing surveillance. When a device is brought to market, you want to make sure that whatever performance you showed in a lab, when you're deploying in the real world, there's an opportunity for the device to stay performant. And the reason performance can drift is because of, you know, maybe the population changes, maybe something like COVID happens. In our own studies, we did this beautiful study that came out in Nature Medicine going back to our work in sepsis. We started in one site and then we took the device to a second site and a third site and a fourth and a fifth site. And then through the course of these sites, COVID happened, which was the biggest surprise. And what we were able to show was the, you know, the performance, like it's essentially because we built the tool and the device in a way that was adaptive. And you can do that with AI in an intelligent fashion. We were able to show that the device stayed performant over the course of these deployments through different sites. Also, as COVID, a population they'd never seen before, the system was able to tune and improve and stay performant. And uh, under the FDA rubric in December of last year, there was a new regulation passed called Predetermined Change Control uh, Point. So basically PCCP in short, which allows you to continue to tune devices in the real world in order to stay and improve performance, which I think is brilliant news because it now allows companies, um, you know, to deliver tools that are going to be truly performant in the real world and do this in a way that is fully, you know, there's great good oversight over it. Now, you know, obviously imp implementing and operationalizing all this is really where the, you know, the, the questions remain. But uh, I'm exceptionally excited about both sort of the overarching framework. And I think there's a very clear line of sight to how this can happen and also the ability for AI to actually be deployed very responsibly at the point of care. Yeah, and you, and you just articulated, I think, what is such a challenge for companies that are building in this space is you've got the speed with which regulation and regulatory frameworks are moving. Um, and then you also have the speed with which like the health systems that you are working with are able to build the appropriate infrastructure and have the appropriate practices in place to enable you to even take advantage of the fact that you have... Um, you know, access to all this dynamic data and, and such. And and we know uh, from our many conversations that pretty much every health system in the country at this point is trying to come up with their quote unquote AI strategy. And as, I, as I've seen it, I think there's multiple pillars to that. One is in some cases, it's actually like literally AI, yes or no, right? We've actually seen a few health systems say, we're going to shut down access to chat GPT for all of our employees until we figure out um, whether they're there, there, which has been uh, kind of, you know, remarkable to see. Um, you know, those who are leaning into an AI strategy are saying, okay, on the one hand, what are the use cases for which AI should and can be applied? And, uh, and you know, with responsibility and safety, obviously a huge dimension of that. Um, and then I would say a third pillar is 
what is the actual IT and data infrastructure uh, and then policies and procedures that go along with that, that we need to put in place to fully take advantage of these cutting edge technologies that are now being brought to us by companies like Bayesian. Um, you have probably participated in so many of these conversations yourself. Like, is this a productive exercise for organizations to be doing? What's like the right framework that you would say is um, the the most productive way to to uh, sort of resolve uh, those open strategic conversations that health system executives are having these days? Yeah, I think I think it's hard to execute without a strategy. So it's very important to have a strategy in place. It's also important to be humble about having a strategy in place because what's also happening is by doing, you're going to learn a lot. So there are a couple of different um, like things, open items I see, and I'm part of a couple of different large national collaboratives uh, with leaders from both uh, health systems, but also insurance companies around planning an AI strategy and what should that look like and what the use cases are and so on and so forth. So the first thing is, I think, uh, steer away from just, you know, doing uh, pilots, you know, like the distractions, the glitzy objects. I see a lot of what's happening is, you know, in in some sense, chat GPT, I mean, AI has been growing for a long time. The excitement for AI in healthcare is what feels like uh, two quarters old because they, you know, chat GPT was released in Q4 of last year. And, you know, that suddenly opened up consumer excitement and interest, board level interest, which then percolated down to leadership interest, which percolated, you know, so they, they're getting bombarded from all sides. And it's starting from like a consumer level experience in the grounds of how many advances had occurred over the last decade and especially the last, right? So interestingly, I was in a National Academies meeting earlier last week where this um, a colleague made this uh, observation that like, you know, suddenly they can't keep AI out. And they can't keep AI out because essentially all the consumer-led efforts is making it so that, you know, generally in enterprises, decisions are made in the center on the top. And there, they're more reluctant to try out new ideas, to take on new things. Consumers are curious. And so essentially, our clinicians, our care teams, our back office people have all become consumers and they're bringing ideas. So I think such an interesting time. It's clear AI is necessary. I think... Um, the issue is not, it's hard for me to imagine a system that's going to stay live and stay around five to 10 years from now if their strategy started with AI, no. So I think it's definitely a question of AI, yes, and the question of how and what and where do we perform given where we are. And so number one, sort of the simple thing that people can align on and is let's find experienced teams that really know what they're doing, that have deep know-how in an area and then what you need to evaluate is for your system, is that area or is that thing that it's doing productive for you to take on? So rather than just engaging with AI as a technology, let me just try to engage with AI and do something with AI. Instead, find something, find projects that are aligned with your core, the core of your business, whether it's, you know, core of your business and healthcare, is, you know, whether it's care delivery, ultimately you're delivering care, that's why you exist. And Bayesian is, you know, focused on the core of care delivery. You know, if you are looking to, you know, perhaps you're in an area where back office is your issue, whatever the issue areas are, identify your issue areas, find teams that are deeply focused in those issue areas that have deep expertise, and then make sure you're solving problems that you deeply care to solve, and not just because you're doing this to explore the technology. The other thing that I see a common misconception is this notion of like, uh, rather than focusing on teams with deep expertise, in both the domain and the problem and the technology, seeking out teams which are just pure tech experts. Over and over again in the last decade, we've seen this from tech entrants who are coming into healthcare who have very limited experience in healthcare. And there's just a huge gap in what it takes to get AI to work within a problem setting. And that knowledge of the problem setting is very crucial for being able to operationalize it. Just as an example, with Bayesian, in the last, you know, I've spent over a decade now thinking about how do we make AI, you know, work at the point of care, work for our care teams. And, you know, actually, to be fair, some of the other like claims in IELTS, back office, those problems are simpler, they're easier. But on the flip side, you know, it pains me that like we're still practicing like we were in the Flintstone era, 
like literally patient still comes in, you hear what they have to say from anecdotes, you kind of respond to what you have to say. Important life decisions are getting made. Tons of data is getting collected, but there's so little use of it. But simultaneously, even from a system perspective, you know, we're like one in three nurses are leaving the workforce. We know about staffing shortages. We know about declining margins. We know that the patients that are coming in to see are higher, more higher acuity and our care teams are getting constantly being asked to do more with less. This nothing I'm saying here is news. It's just that we're in denial. We don't want to solve the problems that are in front of us. And any system that doesn't know how to think about this and doesn't put a strategy in place, I don't know what they're planning to do. So I think there's such an opportunity here to use AI with data and the right infrastructure to do this well. Going back to your point about is every system going to stand up a team that does monitoring and reporting and data shut drift and shift and needs all this expertise? Yeah, we'll definitely see, see large academic medical centers where they want to and can hire a team of 50 to 100 people who do things like this. But I also feel like we can borrow a card from other sectors. There are other sectors where we've brought AI to life by having fully managed end-to-end -end service. And so, for instance, the way Bayesian is doing this is we're basically build, bringing our deep expertise on the reimbursement, regulatory, like what it takes, and then point of care delivery to essentially, uh, you know, the platform plugs into your, you know, workflow and delivers a service so that you don't need to worry about things like drift and shift and managing end-to-end -end performance and measuring performance. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's much like, you know, you bought an ultrasound machine and it works. And in the same way, this kind of software has to work. And what you care about is getting guarantees. What is the thing I need to know to show it's really working? Can I measure that? And can you show me it's working? And then what it takes to make the sausage happen is your problem, not my problem. Yeah. And what you're talking about, Suchi, is basically creating, you know, so Bayesian has its own products that it has developed itself and has brought to market. And I know you've been very thoughtful about not just the uh, the clinical rigor and, and the technical rigor, but also the business model that justifies that this is a an application area that makes sense from a value proposition perspective for the customers that I'm serving. And then similarly, if a health system has internally developed AI algorithms or, or other such assets, that those same governing principles of the justification of why you've brought your own homegrown solutions to market you can apply to those third-party algorithms and help that health system both make the decision about what is a viable uh, product to bring to market, but also potentially help them commercialize that. Is that an accurate description of exactly. what you're saying? So it's a, yeah. it's a platform where we really are partnering with the health system to bring AI to life in the care delivery setting. And we really think end-to-end. -end, and this means, you know, a number of solutions we've developed, but also a number of solutions they might have developed that they want us to operationalize or solutions that other partners have developed that we're helping operationalize yeah, and operationalize and, responsibly. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned something that I think is another sort of top of mind, uh, you know, question that I hear from a lot of executives in the market is, you know, there's sort of like a lamenting of the fact that um, the majority of startups that are building in this space are not going after the clinical domain. And I think we all have our hypotheses about why largely that it's the, probably the hardest domain to go after if you think about the common two by two matrix of, you know, on the one hand, you've got your uh, sort of non-clinical use cases, like, you know, all the ones that you mentioned, back office, et cetera. And then on the other end, you have clinical. Uh, and then the second axis is sort of uh, consumer patient facing versus professional facing. Um, you know, you've, you've made a very de deliberate decision uh, on where to shoot the arrow from a patient perspective, which is the sort of the clinical um, piece and then the provider facing piece. Which again, arguably has you know the highest stakes in many ways. Um, what what gave you conviction? And but but you you probably could have also packaged your IP in many other ways, right? In in other quadrants. What gave you conviction to go after that particular quadrant? And then do you foresee a future in which Beijing moves into other quadrants? And what would need to be true for that for that to happen? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, to um, I think if you go back to the business of healthcare or the business of care delivery. My, uh, you know, when you look at the, the opportunity set, the opportunity set is massive in being able to use data at the point of care to be able to identify in real time, you know, patients at risk for, or moments where there's an opportunity to change the trajectory 
or improve the trajectory by intervening in a timely, more proactive fashion. It's something we all know is where we should have, you know, even under a fee-for-service model. So one thing people will often complain is, oh, yeah, yeah, that is exactly the right thing to do, but are we going to get paid for it? But the reality is, even under a fee-for-service model, when you look at the DRG code, you know, you're getting paid a certain amount for providing care to a patient. If a certain set of complications happen, suddenly the cost of taking care of the patient is way higher. So it behoves you to be able to both, it makes sense, not just from an outcome, patient outcome perspective, but it also makes sense from the point of view of total cost of care. So a health system, when they're coming in, they're implementing ways to provide proactive care in these DRG-based episodes, there's an opportunity to much more tightly manage the care episode. So you're both getting reimbursed more correctly. You're providing, most importantly, high-value care, and you're improving your frontline clinician's experience. Today, there are so many areas where they do, you know, like today, medicine is very much built on a CYA, uh, CYA framework. Like, well, we want to make sure there's documentation for it. So let's make sure we hire some humans to make sure there's documentation for it on every single patient every single day. Simple example, pressure ulcers twice a day. They do head to toe assessments on every patient. Why? Because they need to show documentation so that they don't, you know, in order to mitigate malpractice risk. But turns out only a small pool of these patients are really truly at risk. And if you really could focus your attention on those cases, you could identify them early, mitigate, proactively do something to actually improve outcomes, mitigate risk, mitigate, like reduce total cost of care and not be causing painful work on your care teams to be just going around the block twice a day doing useless work that they don't have belief in in the first place. And then in trying to do it all, we often miss doing the things that's most important. So simple example where the right use of AI at the point of care can dramatically streamline, save time, save cost, and improve outcomes. So from my point of view, you know, to me, some of the other tasks are very much in the fringes. They're important. They're valuable. They can be done. But really at the core of healthcare delivery is care delivery, which is today still very much the way we practiced about 100 years ago. And it's high time, like we're taking and flying helicopters in Mars, but it sucks that we're still killing patients today when they didn't need to die. And if we were just using data better at the point of care, we wouldn't have to, you know, you know, I think there's enormous opportunity. And we all believe five years from now, hopefully we look back and say, holy crap, I can't believe we were doing this in the first place. Yeah, let alone, you know, layering on top of that, all of the the labor uh, constraint challenges that you, you mentioned. So the, the time is nigh. Um, well said. Um, last question here, Suji, another kind of hot topic of debate these days is around, um, is it incumbents? or upstarts who have the bigger advantage when it comes to AI. And in particular, I think this has been surfaced in the context of generative AI, where things like compute infrastructure and access to proprietary data assets and the ability to integrate into workload is, is of paramount importance. Um, what is your point of view on where, specifically with when it comes to health systems, where those incumbents might have a leg up versus areas where they might not? And same question for upstarts, you know, where are the areas where where they're advantaged versus, um, you know, needing to and, and uh, needing to partner with with the incumbents that we're talking about. I think today what I am seeing in the last couple of quarters is suddenly a lot of companies are taking a huge amount of interest in AI, right? They're all starting. They're all learning. They're all excited. They all want to participate, which is fascinating and great. Um, I think from a, you know, in healthcare, there are very small number of dollars. There's not a whole lot of dollars to go around. And what we have to make sure is we're responsibly deploying them. And part of that means really clearly identifying what problems you're looking to solve. How do you know you've solved them? What are you going to use to measure success? And then knowing, are you working with a team where you can succeed? And, you know, do you have confidence you will succeed? In terms of like advantage, I feel the productization in healthcare is such an important issue. Like, and people cough, often miss this. An example is, you know, uh, look at the iPhone, right? And the experience of iPhone, it really brought smartphones to market. But there were other people who could have said they were building phones. There are other people who could have said, yes, I have a messaging tool too. Yes, I have a phone. But the experience from a frontline perspective was very, very different. Productization takes time. Productization requires deep experience. 
So my point of view is that teams where they have deep experience in the technology and deep experience in the domain and who really know how to productize to solve problems are the ones that are going to see the most amount of benefit. And then to really do this well, obviously you have to have all the ecosystem know how to do it, right? So in the case of Bayesian, for instance, it took us years to be able to do what we're doing. If we were starting today and saying, hey, I want to come in and actually help you improve point of care, you should be skeptical. And any company that's doing this and is waking up overnight is going to struggle. But in our scenario, you know, it's been almost a decade in the making, like years to do the deep integrations with the EMRs, years to be able to build that sort of safety infrastructure to allow us to do drift and shift monitoring and et cetera. And then being able to deeply understand users and clinical workflows and variations in clinical workflows across sites to be able to understand how do you splice in in a way that feels natural, seamless, and easy. So I think teams that know how to think about things end to end from a problem perspective and a solution perspective, I think will have the, and obviously then have to have the technical know-how, right? Like AI is not an easy piece of technology. So you have to have deep experience in it. It's very hard for a, a team that's very, you know, like a very simple example is your electronic health record, right? Like they've built amazing, enormous software that is now the backbone of delivering care, your e electronic health record. Yet the bone you need to build that kind of software is very different from what you need to build AI. So really deep experience in the technology is a must. And yes, NVIDIA will benefit because ultimately a lot of compute goes back to NVIDIA and the cloud providers will benefit because ultimately they're serving the servers where the compute happens. But I think there's great need for the people who will sit on top of these and really build the actual productized services that really work, pay attention to detail from a user's point of view. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, what's very clear, Suchi, and especially from my standpoint of where I sit and, you know, meeting with hundreds of entrepreneurs who are building in this, in this domain, it is really a, like still a very finite number of humans on the planet who I think really understand this game and, uh, and, and lean into the intersection of AI, clinical business and commercialization while, you know, having such a comprehensive view of the broader ecosystem. So, um, thank you as always for sharing your perspective. I'm sure it's been helpful for, for those who are listening to, you know, create some 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 frameworks and some language around how they need to be thinking about this and, and where there's opportunity for partnership. Lovely to chat, Julie, as always. Thank you for having me.